Okay, let's get started, please. Okay, does anybody um, remember what we are talking about? It's been a long time. Maybe people have forgotten. Anybody tell me? Devin? You weren't here on Wednesday? <laughs> diagonalization. Okay, that's a good guess because that's sort of like the big idea, right? Um, diagonalization. So, diagonalization. Even my pens have dried out. Diagonalization. Um, is anybody, uh, anybody who was here? Say something more specific than that? Or did anybody watch the video? Um, yeah, Molly. Geometric and algebraic multiplicities. Geometric, ge geometric and algebraic multiplicities, great. So that's that's the last thing that geometric, these two things, geometric and algebraic uh, multiplicity. And um, what were these things? Anybody remember what these things were? These were this is a term that we used to describe um, a quality of the of the eigenvalue. Right? So you talk about the geometric multiplicity of an eigenvalue. Right? Right? Um, Anybody remember the geometric multiplicity? What that's talking about? If you don't, that's fine. Just shake your head. Don't have to. Don't have to. Um, like, ju don't just look at the floor. Shake your head or nod your head. No. <laughs> okay. Geometric multiplicity. Um, this was. Um, this was the dimension of the eigenspace. The so you talk, talk about the geometric multiplicity of an eigenvalue. That's the dimension of the eigenspace. Okay, the algebraic multiplicity of an eigenvalue. Anybody remember that? No? Yes? Anybody who's here? Those of you who have not forgotten all mathematics over Thanksgiving break. Anybody? Russ? Thank you. <coughs> the degree of, of this thing, the degree of lambda as a root of the characteristic polynomial, right? The degree of lambda as a root of the characteristic polynomial, right? Okay. And what we finished up with at the end of class uh, on Wednesday was that um, the, uh, well, so, there are two things that we noticed. One is that um, the sum of the algebraic multiplicities of all the eigenvalues um, equals n, right, where we have, as usual, some n stands for the, the size of the matrix. That's the sum of the degrees, right? The sum of the degrees of the roots of a polynomial is going to equal to the degree of the polynomial, right? Okay. And the second thing we noticed, uh, this was the harder one, uh, was that the geometric multiplicity always turned out to be less than or equal to the algebraic multiplicity. Okay. The geometric multiplicities always turned out to be less than or equal to the algebraic multiplicities, right? And so these two together give you uh, a third observation, which is that the, um, the matrix has, uh, uh, there is a base, so A is diagonalizable, diagonalizable, if and only if um, all geometric multiplicities are equal to the algebraic multiplicities. Okay. 
because that's the only way, that is a way and the only way that you're going to have enough eigenvectors to diagonalize. Right? That's the only way, that's the only way, only then, so we should say then and only then, then and only then does one have enough linearly independent eigenvectors to form an eigenvector basis. That is where we closed up. Um, that's where we closed up on Wednesday. Okay. So um, the the main idea, remember, it is diagonalization, and it's this idea that you know sometimes you're lucky and your matrix turns out to be equivalent to a diagonal matrix, right? That is, you have a matrix and uh, you can find a basis that with respect to which the matrix representation is diagonal, right? If your matrix is diagonal, then the behavior of your matrix is really simple, right? You know, if you, if you want to multiply your matrix a billion times, it's really easy, right? This is something we saw earlier. So you, you kind of like your um, matrix to be diagonalizable. Um, it's not always diagonalizable, but um, we're sort of getting our way towards you know, when it is diagonalizable. Um, okay, so 6.4 is basically um, sort of uh, our some classical results in diagonalization. So some results about diagonalization. Okay, and I'm kind of sorry we're not going to get to the to the like the big answer, which is <coughs> so diagonalization is the first <laughs> step in sort of understanding what linear transformations do, right? Some of them are diagonalizable. That's great, but it turns out that every linear transformation is every square linear transformation is almost diagonalizable. Okay, and sort of like the the big answer in this, if we walked a bit further down the road, we would get to something called the Jordan canonical form. Okay. We're not going to get to the Jordan canonical form. But if you take a second course, uh, 173, you know, advanced linear algebra, then they would give they would get to this uh, this like more complete answer. But we'll get we'll get somewhere. We'll we'll walk down the road a fair amount as we already have. Okay. okay. So um, some results about diagonalization. Um, uh, the, the title of this section is called Hermitian, Hermitian Matrices. Okay. And um, this is sort of like a, a momentary reboot. Um, so we're going to start over from some very basic ideas, and then we'll work over to some, 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 something more complicated. Okay. So um, yeah. those of you who have been feeling lost, this is a time to sort of get, get back on the train, basically. Okay, so um, uh, so we'll be dealing with complex complex matrices. So um, so let's first recall um, if you have a complex number, okay. so you have some some complex number z in some some number z in the complex numbers. This z is a plus b i where A and B are real numbers, right? Like 3 plus 4i, or something like that, OK? OK. Um, so for a complex number, we defined z bar as um, A minus bi, right? And this guy was the complex conjugate. Complex. Conjugate. Uh, see? Okay. 
And remember, that was the reflection across the real axis, right? You have some, um, <coughs> you have some some guy, right? Three plus four i, and you have three minus four i, which is its complex conjugate, the reflection across the real axis. Okay. Um, other definitions. Um, this is one definition. Another definition, I'm going to call it the modulus of a complex number. Um, it's just another word for the absolute value, okay? the magnitude, the size, and the complex number. Okay. So we use the absolute value sign for it. It's just another word. I, I don't even know why we introduce another word. We should just call it the absolute value. Okay. The absolute value of a complex number is defined to be the, um, the square root of z times z bar. OK, square root of z times z bar. Right? And you think about that, right? Z, uh, right? z is a plus bi. Z bar is a minus bi. Right? So what do you get when you multiply z by z bar? Then a squared plus b squared? A squared plus b squared, right? Because you're going to get a squared minus bi squared, right? Yeah, you got something plus something, something minus something. You get the first thing minus the second thing squared, right? So you get the first thing minus the second thing squared, but the second thing squared is b squared i squared. i squared is negative 1, and so you get you get a plus, right? Okay, so this is going to be the square root of a squared plus b squared, right? Which is, um, which is the distance to the origin, right? The length of uh, the size of your, you know, the distance to the origin of, from this of this point. Okay. Okay. So you've got the modulus, right? Z times z bar. Um, okay. uh, so we're going to be looking at vectors in Cn. Okay. So the vectors are not in Rn anymore. They're going to be in Cn. So you have some you have some uh, some vector, some complex vector, which will be a bunch of complex numbers: z1, z2. Zn, right, where the zi are all complex numbers from i equals 1 to n. Right. So it's just like your old, old real vectors, just complex numbers now. Okay. And um, as you might guess, we'll have the uh, complex conjugate of a complex vector. Right. It'll just be you complex you conjugate all the metrics. Okay. Nothing nothing amazing. Uh, most most of today will not be amazing, so I don't know if that's a relief to you or 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 a, a disappointment. Uh, and I hope it's a disappointment. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, next thing we define the magnitude of a complex vector as the um, you take the complex conjugate of the vector, you transpose it, you multiply that thing by the vector itself, and then take the square root of that. Right? You see what's going to happen, right? You would get z1 bar, z2 bar, zn bar, times z1 through zn, everything square rooted. Right. And so you would get um, 
a number, right? Z1 bar Z1 plus Zn bar Zn to the one half, right? In other words, Z1 modulus of Z1 squared plus modulus of Z1 squared to the one half. And so you're just taking the, um, you know, it's just like the real numbers. You take the absolute values, some of the absolute values squared, and then take the hat, take the square root of that. Right? It's just that now these are the moduli rather than the real absolute values. Okay? Moduli of the complex number, the absolute value of the complex number rather than the absolute rather than the absolute value of the real number. Okay. Okay. So far. Very simple, I hope. Um, okay. Uh, remark that the book uh, notates uh, Z conjugate transpose as Z super H. Z super H, which is not not standard. Like I don't think. I've, again, I don't think I've seen this anywhere outside of this book. But it's it's useful. So like we'll we'll use this. Okay. We'll use this. Z super H is gonna mean Z conjugate transpose. Okay. Um okay. So next thing is going to be important. We can define an inner product on the uh, on Cn. <coughs> okay, and our inner product will be this: the inner product of z against w. is going to be the conjugate transpose of Z uh, of, of W against Z. Right. That makes sense. Um, right. So this we can rewrite as um, as Z inner product, Z to the one half. Right. That's the inner product you want. Okay. So it's a little funny, right? You take the you take the conjugate transpose of the second vector and multiply that by the first vector. So this is um, I mean this is this is almost like uh, you know if we're back in the real if we're back in the reals right if we have um, one vector uh, and another vector right if we take the inner product if we take the dot product of these vectors we take the dot dot product of real so back in <coughs> in Rn, right? The dot product of these guys is just, you know, you take this guy transpose times times this guy, right? It's the transpose of one vector multiplied by the other vector, right? So this this definition is not so strange, right? Right? Except that we're taking the conjugate of the second vector. We take the conjugate of the second vector conjugate transpose and multiply it by the first vector. Okay, so um, exercise. Check that this is an inner product. Okay, 
So I'll leave that to you to see that it satisfies the properties of an inner product. Okay. But actually, I'm lying to you. This is not an inner product. Okay. Actually, it's not an inner product. So let me let me um, let me leave this blank open for a second and. Uh, it's a problem. It's not really a problem. Um, what happens if we? What happens if we multiply it by a number? So suppose you multiply the second vector by a number. Suppose you multiply the second vector by a number. If this were an inner product, what, what would be the answer? What, what can we do with this, with this number? <coughs> then? You can just factor it out. It would be the same as the inner product without that except multiply. Exactly. You can, pull that, you can pull that number out right? by linearity. Right? So <coughs> you could, if, this were, if this were a real inner product, um, our old-fashioned inner product, the kind of inner products we've been talking about, this should just be alpha times the inner product, ZW, right? Should be. Should be just alpha times the inner product, Z times W, right? That's, that's one of the properties of our, that we know about inner products, right? You can just pull the number out. Okay, but what happens for, for our inner product? What happens with our new inner product? Give you 30 seconds to tell me the answer. Talk with somebody for a second or two. Turn, turn to somebody nearby and say, what did you have for Thanksgiving? Or? <laughs> I was kidding. I <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what's the answer? What do you get? Do you get do you get alpha Z W? Do you get alpha Z W? No. Right? Obviously no. <laughs> right? You know it's not gonna work out. What do you actually get? <coughs> alpha conjugate. Alpha conjugate, right? Alpha bar. Right? Because uh, what you get is alpha w bar transpose transpose z, right? Alpha w bar transpose z, that's the same thing as alpha bar w bar transpose z, but that's alpha bar times z w, right? Okay, so, um, but, the way we describe this in mathematical <coughs> language is we say that um, this uh, uh, this thing is not linear in the second variable. Okay, we say it is um, it is what's called conjugate linear. conjugate linear in the second variable. Um, <coughs> um, we don't call this, uh, uh, we say that this thing is a, what's called a complex inner product. Okay, so now we distinguish between the inner products that we've had before and these guys. These guys are called complex inner products. Anything that satisfies the rules of the inner product 
but is conjugate linear in the second variable is called a complex inner product. And the old guys are called actually real, real inner products. We didn't say it at the time because we just call them inner products, but they're actually called real inner products. So this is actually not an inner product, it's a complex inner product. That's why I left the blank there. Okay. So so far so so you know, nothing nothing major has happened. Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um continuing in the same vein. Let's talk about complex matrices. Okay, so M by N matrices where the M by N <coughs> matrices where the entries are all complex numbers. So we call it C M cross M, M cross N. Okay. So as you might expect, um, uh, if M is a complex matrix. Um, then we define F bar, uh, it's conjugate. By conjugating each entry, so you just conjugate every single uh, every single entry. And now we finally introduce something a little bit interesting. Um, if M equals M uh, conjugate transpose, in other words, M equals MH, we call um, M a Hermitian matrix. matrix after the mathematician Hermit. Okay, so let's think about what this means, right? What does Hermitian mean, right? Um, so if if M is real, right, a real matrix, what does permission mean? Suppose you have a real matrix and you know that um, it's permission. What's what is that? What do we normally call that? We have a name for that. Right. A matrix. Well, if it's a real matrix, when you conjugate it, what happens? It's the same, right? So this would say that M equals M transpose, right? In other words, M is a. You guys have forgotten the word? M equals M transpose? It is a. Symmetric matrix, symmetric matrix. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Good. Good. Right, it would mean uh, M would be symmetric, right? Okay. Right. It would be symmetric. Right. So Hermitian is just some sort of complex version of being a symmetric matrix. It's like it's like a symmetric matrix, but but not exactly the same. So let me give you an example of a of a Hermitian matrix. If I have something like this, d plus i, d minus i, zero. Okay. 
Like if I take the transpose, right, and then I conjugate everything, right, I get the same thing back. Right? If I take the transpose of this guy, take the transpose, and then conjugate everything, you see that I get the same same matrix. Okay? So it's not exactly, it's not a symmetric matrix, right? But something like one, right? These guys, these guys that reflect across the diagonal are complex conjugates of each other. Okay. And you see, what else do you see about the diagonal? What do you see about the diagonal? The diagonal has to be real, number. real numbers, right? Because they have to be equal to their complex conjugates. Diagonals have to be real. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Let me have you do an exercise in one minute. If you have, um, if A is Hermitian, then then you can move it across the complex inner product. You can pass it across the complex inner product. Think about that for, I don't know, I'll give you 30 seconds. Why is that? Make, make sure you, you can see that that's true. Just ask, what is this? What is this? Okay, and see that they're equal. <coughs> write down what this thing is, or turn to, turn, turn to somebody nearby and tell them what this what this is. What is this? Let's, let's do it. What is this? Z, Z against AW. What's that going to be? By definition? By definition? AWH. AWH times Z. Right? That's, that's what it is, right? And remember what H is. H is. Uh, conjugate transpose, right? So, you know, you can, like we said before, a transpose of a product is a product of the transposes. So I'm going to break that, break that transpose into transpose, transpose, right? When you take the, I'm sorry, when I take the, con when you take the conjugate of a product, it's a product of the conjugates, okay? What about, I have a transpose of a product, what's that going to be? transpose of a product, remember, when you have matrices and you multiply them, you take the transpose, you get the product of the transposes, but in the, you have to switch the order, right? You reverse the order, right? So you get this thing times this thing. Transpose of a product is the product of the transposes in the reverse order, right? And so you see what you get. You get W H A H Z, right? But if this is our emission matrix, then A H is the same thing as A, right? So you get this W H A Z. Right? 
but that is the same thing as this. Right? AZ against W is WH AZ. Right? And so they're equal. Okay? Well, that's cool. Right? If you if you have a permission matrix, then you can pass it, you can pass it through the pass it back and forth through the inner product. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and the permission matrices are going to be sort of, as you can tell by the title, um, the topic of this of this section. So now let's start to talk about some real stuff, um, but still not that not that complicated. Um, so let A be a square matrix. If A is Hermitian, then one. Um, the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues of A are all real. The eigenvalues of A, eigenvalues of A actually has a, has a name, it's called the spectrum of A. Spectrum of A. The set of, the set of all the eigenvalues, the spectrum. Later on we'll talk about something called the spectral theorem. Spectral does not mean ghosts or anything. It refers to the spectrum. Okay. Um, two, uh, eigenvalue, eigenvectors corresponding to uh, distinct eigenvalues are Eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal. Okay. That should be kind of surprising, um, or pleasing even, right? That the eigen eigenvectors, we already knew if you have distinct eigenvalues and you have eigenvectors, we knew something about them, right? Anybody remember? We, we saw that these guys are actually linearly independent. We already knew that these guys would be linearly independent, but they're better than linear, linearly independent. They're orthogonal. Okay. okay, so um, let me get the proof of the first guy. So why are all the eigenvalues real? So suppose that uh, you have a vector. Um, <coughs> suppose you have a vector, and it's in some eigenspace. We want to see that lambda must be a real number. Okay. So I'm going to say consider the inner product V against AV. Consider the inner product V against AV. Okay, so um, AV, V is an eigen, V is an eigenvector. So what's AV? What's AV? Stella? Lambda. lambda V, right? So this, I'm going to go downwards. This equals lambda V. Right? Um, the inner product is conjugate linear, so what's this equal to? By conjugate linearity, this equals what? Conjugate linearity, I can pull the lambda out, and I get lambda bar. Someday I'll think of a better way of encouraging you to speak than by just slowing my own speech down. But um, okay, so you get lambda bar v v, v, v times v, right? In other words, lambda bar, lambda bar times the magnitude of v squared. We don't really need that last part. Okay, now I'm going to go across here and say, well, look, um, uh, 
this guy is here mission, A is here mission. So by the exercise we just said, we just did, we can pull the A to the other side. Right? We pull the A to the other side, and we get this. Right? You see what's gonna happen when I do it this way? What am I gonna get down here? What am I gonna get at the bottom here? Over here I got lambda bar, magnitude of v squared. Over here I'm gonna get what? Lambda. lambda. Right? I'm gonna get lambda, magnitude of v squared. Right? Okay. And remember that v is a non-zero vector, right? I'm gonna cancel out the magnitude of v squared on both sides, and I get that lambda bar equals lambda, right? In other words, lambda is real. Right? So you do the same, same sort of thing, right? You get lambda v, v, you get lambda v, v, right? And you get that lambda is real. Okay, so all the eigen uh, values of a Hermitian matrix have to be real. Um, any questions about that? Anybody confused? Anybody, anybody following Nico? Yeah, so thanks. What, what is the thing that you can say A, V equals lambda V? That's just a rule of I can. That's, uh, that's just this part here, right? Uh, la uh, v is an eigenvalue. I v, is an I v is in this eigenspace. That's the same thing. Oh, V is one of the things that is an eigenvalue. It's an eigenvector, right? So A times V is lambda V. Okay, right. that's the same one. that's that's the same that's what this means okay. that's what that means okay other questions other questions okay uh, second one we want to see that the eigen spaces are, are, are orthogonal okay right so say that um, v1 corresponds to is in one eigenspace and V2 is in the second eigenspace. Second eigenspace. Right? Okay. And that, uh, of course, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are different. So you want to see that, want to see, want to show that, um, uh, that these guys are perpendicular. That V1 against V2 is 0. that these complex vectors are perpendicular to each other. OK, so what we do is we say, well, look, um, we play the same, basically the same game. Right? So we consider, consider AV1 against V2. Consider AV1 against V2. Say, okay, well, this guy is an eigenvector, right? So we know this is going to be lambda 1 V1 against V2. Right? And we can pull that lambda out. We get lambda against, it's like lambda times V1 V2. Okay. On the other side, just like we did last in the last theorem, we in the last proof, we're going to pull the a over to the other side because it's unit. I'm sorry, it is uh, Hermitian. Right. So you can pull that pull the a to the other side, right? And we get v1 against lambda two v2. Oops, there should be a lambda one here. There should be a one. Okay, now what happens when I pull the lambda 2 out? What do I get? Okay. Lambda 2 bar? Lambda 2 bar, yes. 
But remember, by part one, lambda two bar is real. I mean, lambda two is real. So we can get rid of the bar. Okay. So we end up with this, right? Lambda one v one v two equals lambda two v one v two. Okay, and we know that lambda one and lambda two are different, right? Lambda one and lambda two are not equal to each other, right? So what does that tell you? That tells you that lambda I'm sorry, that v one against v two must be equal to zero. If it's not equal to zero, we're in trouble. Right? We'll end up with lambda one equaling lambda two. Because we could then cancel it off from both sides. Okay, we have one minute. That's enough time for me to say something. Okay, so there's a corollary. So if uh, A is permission and has distinct eigenvalues, if A is permission and has distinct eigenvalues, um, <coughs> what's going to happen? Wait, has uh, And distinct eigenvalues. So all its eigenvalues are different from each other. There's no repeated, no repeated roots in the characteristic polynomial. Well, what's going to happen? Well, you could find. What are you going to get? Remember what happened last time, right? If you're any matrix as n distinct eigenvalues, then you can make an eigenvector basis, right? Because you have n distinct, you have n linearly independent eigenvectors, OK? So we're going to get something better than that. It's got to be better than that, right? We'll have n linearly independent eigenvectors, but the better. They'll be orthogonal to each other, OK? So then we have, have n orthogonal eigenvectors, right? And in fact, we can normalize them to make them orthonormal, right? Make them norm one. OK, so um, there exists. In other words, uh, let me so leave this part out. Then there exists a complex orthogonal matrix, right? Complex orthonormal matrix that diagonalizes. So it'll be a complex matrix where all the columns are all the columns are orthonormal. They're orthogonal to each other and they're of norm one. Okay. Um, there's a there's the actual term for this is unitary. Unitary. But we'll we'll mention we'll say this again at the beginning next time. But you see, you see, I hope everybody sees that this is what happens as a consequence of this. Right? So whenever you have a permission matrix with n distinct eigenvalues, then it's not just diagonalizable, but it's diagonalizable in a very nice way. Right? There is a there is a matrix of orthogonal, right, of orthonormal vectors that diagonalizes it. Okay, that's it for today.